Hello, I'm Professor Liu. Welcome to our live stream. I'm joined today by art prof teaching artist Alex Rowe. And today we are starting a series on complementary colors. Today we are specifically focusing on red and green. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, Art Prof has everything you need, critiques, tutorials, and professional development. Now, color is such a huge topic. And I think what's really hard for people is it's such a overwhelming topic that there's so much to cover. And so what we're gonna try to do is to boil it down to the essentials, the things that you cannot live without. And if you guys wanna get more complicated and scientific, that's cool. But <laughs> today we're gonna start with the complementary colors. So let's just identify, what are they, Alex? Complementary colors are essentially colors that play off their own strengths. They are red and green, uh, purple and yellow, and blue and orange. So there are a lot of things in color theory that get so complicated that I don't think you really have to memorize them. This you should memorize. <laughs> this should be <laughs> something that is like breathing because it is a concept you're going to want to be referencing in your work. So Alex, can you get into a little bit more why these pairs of colors work so well together? Yeah. And as you were talking about, you could dive into the theory, which I keep joking I'll do in my retirement is really dive into the science behind it. But really, all you need to know for practical means is that in these colors existing opposite the color wheel, they play up each other's strengths. They are good complements to each other. And as we visually perceive them, it allows them to pop and lets our eye be pleased by the images we see, essentially. Well, Alex, when I was in art school, I had a professor who went over the complementary colors and he did what we're doing now, which is showing examples and saying, look at the complementaries and how they work together. I'll be honest, when he showed us those slides, the only thing I could think was, yeah, right. They probably just made colors and my professors just happened to pick these slides and he's trying to find it, but people aren't really doing it on purpose. So yeah. I guess my question is, do you think it's just an accident or do you as an artist <laughs> actually try to put them together? It's funny. I had the exact same feeling freshman year looking at art history slides. I'm like, come on. They just, it's just lucky. Like whatever. They made the sky blue. They gave him a orange shirt. Hooray. Like I didn't think there was anything to it, but now that I'm more in the realm of practicing artists and I realize how much intent goes behind my choice of color and palettes. And the real mind blower is when you can start to see it everywhere. Like that's when you know you're starting to appreciate color is when you notice it everywhere. And sometimes it's not as obvious as say Monet's poppies in a field. I mean, this is about as obvious as you can get in terms of red and green, but I'll tell you guys, next time you're looking at art, whether it's on a screen or in a museum, ask yourself, do I see complementaries being used here? Because sometimes you don't even notice it. But then if you stop and really look carefully, you're like, whoa, that really does work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Alex, have you ever read this book? No, I've wanted to in a kind of self-punishment way because I've heard it's a slog to get through. Let us know in the chat, how many of you are real color nerds and have read Joseph <laughs> Albers' quintessential color theory textbook, Interaction of Color? I'm curious to know. I have never read it, but it is held up as the Bible of color theory. I don't know about you, Alex. I'm not interested in all the nerdy science. <laughs> art. And I, I just get really overwhelmed. I feel like it's too much information. I mean, do you feel the desire to go this deep? I definitely feel the desire, um, but I'll use the engineering phrase that it's not necessary for the practical execution. <laughs> like, I, the way I view color is I respect it like ancient humanity respected a deity. 
Like I honor it, I praise it, I sacrifice a goat every once in a while, but that's all I know. <laughs> and that's good enough for me. But I'm not joking when I say I would love to just kick back, relax, and just dive into the really nerdy nature behind color. Ooh, look at this comment from Michelle <gasps> who's saying you can play with the colors on the Albers app. How did I not know that this exists? Oh, that's great. <laughs> All right, we're going to have to check that yeah, out. Yeah, I'm downloading that right now. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to guess most people watching have heard of the color wheel. It was probably hanging in your elementary school art room when you guys were growing up. But as much as I tend to roll my eyes at the color wheel sometimes, it does have its use. So let's just start out by explaining how it's arranged because it actually sort of makes a lot of sense. So for example, Alex, can you explain what the primaries are? Yeah, the primaries in the purest definition are colors that cannot be mixed. They exist purely as they are and they cannot be created. Uh, you know, in other words, straight from the tube. You cannot mix colors together to make blue, yellow, or red. They simply are. So if you have primaries, you have red, blue, and yellow. You can't make yellow. You just get it straight out of the tube. Mm -hmm. Now, we have secondary colors, which are literally in between the primaries. And these are basically mixtures of the primaries. So, Alex, can you explain the placement and how that relates? Yeah, and this is really what ties the whole color wheel together. You mix it red and yellow in equal parts and you get orange. You mix blue and red in equal parts and you get purple. And, of course, there's the whole slew of the colors in between. You mix blue and yellow, of course, and you get green. That's pretty much it, guys. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's other stuff you can talk about. And a lot of people are like, ooh, tertiary colors. I'm like, whatever, just mix the color. Like, this is all you really need. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's show how the complementaries relate on the color wheel. So Alex, why don't you go through how this works? Yeah, so complementaries are opposites on the color wheel. And essentially, in the middle is gray. And that's an important feature. We'll get to that in just a second. But these colors, and this is where I, I can't speak fully to the theory of how our eyes work and what's going on with our brain and our eyes when we see them. But the colors work well together and complement each other. We have a question from Fausto. I'd like to know your opinion on magenta, cyan, and yellow being the real primary colors instead of the ones we're taught in elementary school. Does it hmm. really make a difference? It's a great question. What's your take, Alex? I think that my take is that it's, I can see it, but I think that there are so many slews of colors that still fall into the realm of primary. Like take blue, you have the realms all the way in Prussian blue to indigo to cobalt to cerulean, and they're all unmixable blues. Where it seems for me, it's just easier to think of just blue as the blanket statement. What do you think about that? I'm the same way. I mean, you can say, oh, red magenta, they're so different. They are, but they're in the same country, right? And it's like when it comes down to it, nothing really is like the color wheel. I mean, I was getting all these paints ready because we're doing a paint along tomorrow. And I'm like, hello, Prussian blue. Hey, Cerulean. It's like, they're all in the <laughs> same place. So I feel that I have this like Neanderthal approach to color. Like, I don't know, maybe everybody else is more nuanced than me, but I sort of could care less. I don't know if that's a little bit scandalous, but that's just how I feel. No, I, I think it's a really good concept of, think of it as we as humans have been looking at and studying colors for so long, so, so long. And now what's filtered through in the same way that your average third grader knows technically more math than an ancient Greek mathematician. So to the basic art school classroom has a greater concept of color than early artists. We have that human history of understanding to filter it into, hey, hey, hey don't worry about it. Blue and orange, they're complementary. You're good. <laughs> 
Oops, sorry. Wrong comment. I think I lost it. Here we go. Trent is saying CMYK, K equals black, is used a lot for printing. It is easier mm. for subtractive color systems. Yeah, that's where I'm like, I don't know anything about how all that technical stuff works. Carol is saying, are you sure you can't get red by mixing magenta and lemon yellow? What do you think, Alex? Hmm. That's actually a really good question. I think that the way I look at that is that primary colors cannot be mixed. So if you can mix a color to create it, then you are not making it, if that makes sense. And I know this seems like a cop-out answer, but I'd say it's like red-orange is a very big difference from red, that pure red. And so I think that in mixing magenta and yellow, you would get something closer to like a rich like Venetian red or an auburn color, which is technically an orange. Cool. All right. So now we're going to talk about two different exercises. One that really helped me in my color understanding and a technique that Alex does with underpainting that I just think is brilliant. So this is the one color chart that I ever assign. Like, Alex, did you ever do one of those epic color charts in art school, like 5,000 squares and gouache. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, I did, but it was self-assigned because I missed the gouache boot camp in freshman year. I had a different professor. And so when I started to get interested in gouache sophomore year, I figured, oh, I should probably do this. And it was actually very valuable despite the grueling hours. <laughs> You're crazy. You like voluntarily <laughs> did one of those charts. No way. <laughs> so a whole thing about charts is I was told to do some charts sophomore year that were useless. I had one that was supposed to teach us about value and it was, here's the gray, add more white, add some more white, add some more white. I was like, gee, what do you think's going to happen if I add more white? Like it just was really, really boring. This one though, really teaches you to mix colors and it teaches you to see subtleties between grays. And I know I'm always getting on people about don't use straight black out of the tube, stay away from those colors because they get very dull. So let me explain how this works. This is the final outcome. However, Alex, why do you think the student has all these extra swatches? <laughs> <laughs> this is what you're supposed to do but this is what the oh, students yeah. end up doing <laughs> it's surprisingly difficult to mix 50 50 of colors to get a pure balance in them and to get that it's it's very tricky and it does take a little bit of practice so what i tell the students is look don't just paint over so you only end up with nine circles. If you mess up and you're like, oh, that's a little too blue, just paint a swatch of it. So you end up with all these random grays. And it's like, you start looking at those grays, you go, wow, that one really is just a little bit more yellow. This one really is a little bit more warm. And so you end up mixing so many grays by trying to get what essentially is the perfect gray in the middle. So this is the way it starts. Both ends are colored straight out of the tube and you're trying to get to the perfect gray. Mm -hmm. And I'm bringing up this comment by Michelle that's saying, wouldn't that just become brownish? Now I gotta say, I'm not sure if that's referring to this exercise or mixing in like the yellow with a magenta, but I think that raises an interesting question in theory of in there, Clara, like you see, you're not just mixing a gray, you're mixing a warm gray or a cool gray. And I think that this to me was the moment of like mind blowing with learning about color is when someone told me brown is a yellow. Technically speaking on the color wheel, brown is yellow. And it just blew my mind. So I think that, yeah, that attitude, similar to what you're talking about here of it's not just gray. Right. And really, we say perfect gray in quotation. <laughs> like you just try to get there as much as you possibly can. And I think what this exercise does, it sharpens your eye. It gets you to like really look at that gray. And sometimes by doing that, if you go back here, 
it's only by putting down another gray that you realize, oh, that one's too green. So what you start to realize as well is that actually so much of color is about relationships. It's not about, oh, that is the best blue. <laughs> it's, it's like, <laughs> how does that blue look compared to that orange? What do you think about that relationship thing, Alex? Oh, absolutely. Um, this came a lot from exercises I was doing, like when I was in my own personal gouache and watercolor boot camp with a professor. And I was talking about like my favorite colors to use. And he kind of opened my eyes to like, well, those are your favorite colors because of the colors you're using with it. And if you focus on the colors you're using with it, you'll make better paintings. And it was like, oh, that's that's so cool to think about. And so that's why whenever I work with students on color, I say, listen, you can't look at one color. You have to look at a group. Look at how a group of three colors are functioning as a team. And in some ways, I think it was Tony Janola. We have a video with him. I think he's the one who told me to think about colors like people. Because if you have two people in a room, it's like, you know, me and Alex hanging out, that's fine. But it's like, if Deep D comes in and hangs out with us, it's a different dynamic and colors are the same way. Like they change their behavior based on what's around them. So if you guys want to try this exercise, I mean, maybe we could do a paint along on this at some point, but if you want to try it, the concept is that you start with the most saturated color and you work your way towards the middle gray. And then you start on the blue and you go towards the middle gray. So you're starting on the ends and you're going to the middle. Sometimes I do this project. I always have a student that tries to go left to right, but you can't, you have to go <laughs> in those directions because what is happening, Alex? If you start at the most saturated orange, how do you get to the next swatch? So when you're starting to do that, you would just add like a little bit of blue, but the problem is you're not doing it precisely from each color. It, did that phrase make sense? Like if you just get orange and you gradually add blue until eventually you're adding more blue than orange, you're not fully getting a grip of what it's like to say, start from blue and transition to orange. You're not getting a full lens of that. Well, so another thing that is really important for this exercise, most of the time when I do it with students, they don't add enough white. And so if you end up with like really dark grays, it's very hard to see the difference. So if anybody tries this, make sure you're really loading up your colors with white. So that way the differences in the gray feel more obvious. Darwin is saying lighting in the room also makes such a huge difference. I notice it, especially bringing a painting out into the light from my dark apartment. We're going to get there. <laughs> we'll definitely have a stream that talks about lighting and color because, wow, that's a whole other can of worms, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now this for me is like the transition from the color mixing exercise into applying it into a painting situation. That's my problem with the Albert stuff. It's like, you can know all that stuff, but actually putting it into practice is hard. What do you think about that, Alex? Yeah, I, I do think it's hard and maybe unnecessarily so, where if you just are really interested and fascinated by it, like go forth, like I encourage you to, to do what you love. Um, but for me, like I'll use my gouache exercise as an example. I think if I started with the boot camp, I might have hated it. But instead, I started with just learning gouache and learning it in a practical way that I found use for and enjoyed. And then I was like, whoa, 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 let's pump the brakes. I kind of want to learn the basics of this. So I think that it's important to learn it as you're applying it practically. Yeah, I think sometimes people say, well, I got to learn all the theory first, and then I'll paint. And I'm like, no, you should sort of do both at the same time. So they have a little bit more of a bridge. Mm -hmm. Sonnet is saying, I thought we didn't use white because it makes the color chalky. Well, I'm saying very specifically in the context of this project you have to add the white. Otherwise the colors get so dark that you can't see anything. But yes, in general, 
white tends to make things chalky. Like Alex, you told me that actually you really like Naples yellow instead mm -hmm. of white. Why do you use Naples yellow? I use Naples yellow because it doesn't neutralize the color the way white does. Now, granted, it's still, you're playing with yellow as the title would suggest. So you have to take that into account. Um, but it's funny when you said, clarified that using white keeps the colors from getting too dark. Like, can you talk more about how using black can be enhanced by using mixture of colors rather than just black? Well, I think that there's just a lot more potential for variation, all right? So let's say you're doing this project, the complementary color still life. Now, what I say to the students is I say, you can only use those two colors. You're not allowed to use black. You can use white because you need it for sure. But of course you could try Naples yellow. And I think that if you just use black paint, you just keep adding black paint, right? It's like nothing really changes. But if yeah. you have purple and yellow, you're like, oh, well, maybe I need to add a little bit more of a bluish purple as opposed to a reddish purple. And so the possibility that you're going to end up with way more variation in grays, it goes up 10,000%. Oh, yeah. And that brings up like my favorite way to look for and use color theory is in shadows. Like, yeah, it's one thing to do like a Jesper Essing painting in the beginning of like bright yellow against bright purple, and it works really well, but to see much more subtle uses of it where it's a slight yellow light with a rich purple shadow is just A+. plus. And I do think it's easy to make assumptions about what color something is, because you might look at the lemon in this painting and you say, oh, lemons are yellow. Cool. I'm all set, right? <laughs> yeah. But Alex, have you ever looked at something in real life and thought, why are those shadows blue. They should be blue. <laughs> like seriously, yeah. when I was out in Southern Utah, the shadows were so, I was like, this has got to be unreal. Sometimes it's really like that. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is a technique for underpainting that you guys can watch Alex explain in greater depth. It's in our acrylic painting tutorial. Alex, can you tell us what's up with this? Because I thought you were a nutcase when you told me about this. <laughs> I'm a little bit, but I learned this from a bigger nutcase. He was one of my favorite professors named Lenny Long. And it's such a good way to not only incorporate complementary colors, but to also just think about color as you're planning a piece. Uh, so for this case, you start with the underpainting in the complementary color of whatever the subject matter is you're looking at. Now, of course, there are cases where you look at the lobster and it's orange. You look at that drapery and it's red, and you know those things. But I can't tell you the amount of times I've done a painting, either from imagination or from life, and, you know, in my head or in the thumbnails, I'm like, oh yeah, I'll make that some color. But then I'm actually looking at the painting and I'm like, okay, what do I do here? This is a great way to get you to think early of what your color placement is going to be. Well, so here you can see it's a blue lobster. <laughs> the blue is the yep. underpainting. <laughs> the opposite of blue is orange. And so here you can see Alex painting the orange over the blue. So can you explain what is it about having the blue as an underpainting? Because I think most people would say, oh, well, you could do a monochrome underpainting. That's really common. Some people do a grisaille, which is a black and white underpainting because they want to get the value good. And so... Mm -hmm. This concept of like, why would you want blue under something that's supposed to be orange? <laughs> uh, well, so first I'll say like all of those methods are good ones. Like using the black and white underpainting to get values just as useful if you're struggling with value. Uh, for this one, I especially like the chance to let some of the underpainting shine through for some automatic punch in the color contrast. Like when you look at the final painting, Especially, Claire, I can never remember. What is that fruit that looks kind of like an onion with a green on top and little tentacles? I think it's a turnip, isn't it? Well, I can't remember. <laughs> the turnip. Or maybe it's a daikon radish. Maybe <laughs> that's daikon what it radish. Was. That's it. Kind of yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you can notice here in the final that you see some of this pink shining through underneath it. 
which was the color it was in the underpainting, to play off of the green on top of it. And it's those little things where, again, if you plan far enough ahead, you can incorporate those little things to make the color really shine through. Well, so this is another situation where you could say, oh, daikon radishes are white. I'm going to paint them white. But it's like your daikon radish ended up with quite a bit of yellow. And there's a little bit of lavender on the left-hand side. And I don't think you would have done that if you had just gone in with white as your underpainting. Mm -hmm. There's, I can't remember if I'm making up this scene or not. The movie, The Girl with the Pearl Earrings with Colin Firth oh, in it. <laughs> <laughs> that movie was not like good. watching paint peel. Yeah. Oh my God. It's awful. But there's a scene where he's having her look out the window. It's like, what color is the cloud? It's like, it's white. It's like, no, what color is the cloud? And I honestly, it's awful, but I think of that every time I'm painting. <laughs> it really <laughs> just sawed itself in there. So AJ is asking, never use Naples yellow. Alex always sings its praises. Is it really that good? I really like it. For me, Naples yellow was the crutch that was given to me as like, okay, you're using white way too often and it's killing all your colors. Just try this. Like, it worked wonders. It's such a mellow yellow. Uh, pardon the expression. It's just so chill. And it's not oppressive in any way. It's just almost neutral, really. And of course, it is still yellow. So if you mix it with blue, be wary. There will be a greenish tint. But it's such a wonderful replacement for white, especially when you're learning how to use colors and be intentional with how you apply them. It's a game changer because you no longer have this magic paint called white that you can use to just make something brighter because it really doesn't. I mean, what I like about Naples yellow is that when I think about the other yellows that are available, there's not any yellow that does that because I think about, okay, say cadmium lemon, which is just bright and obnoxious and super citrusy, okay? Mm -hmm. There's yellow ochre, which I almost feel like is too tame. It's so muted that it doesn't have a lot of power to it. And then yeah. there's Indian yellow, but Indian yellow is super transparent. It's a very, very thin color. And Naples yellow is just, it's like butter in a tube. It, it's so yummy. Like, how can you not like that color? So it just yeah. has its own unique talents. It's such a good right. highlighter. Oh yeah. Oh my God. It feels so good. You guys have to get some Naples yellow. Great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's take a look at some examples of people who have used red and green as a color scheme. So this is Jennifer Packer. And she actually was one of my colleagues when I taught in the painting department at RISD, but she does these beautiful sumptuous figure paintings. So Alex, how would you describe Packer's treatment of the red and green. Uh, I keep wanting to use food metaphors whenever I describe color. This is just delicious. <laughs> it's so raw and wonderful and exciting. And I have to give a shout out too, especially in this stream. <laughs> there was a Freudian slip of scream because I find these paintings just wonderfully terrifying. But in this stream, talking about red and green specifically, I think there is that challenge with complementary colors where they're used so well. And this one brings up a lot of holiday imagery, just with the red and green. And I think there's that additional challenge in incorporating it in paintings without giving off a Christmas vibe. Dara is asking, how does the complementary underpainting not turn the final color to mud? That's definitely a question for you. Yeah, it's, uh, well, first off, that was for acrylic. So I definitely had that going for me where it was a very light layer beneath and then the thickness of acrylic could just go on dry on top. But I have used the same technique with watercolor, which when you apply a second layer, it re a second layer, it rehydrates. And so I used that complementary underpainting in watercolor for areas that I want to kind of neutralize. Couldn't you also make the underpainting just a lot thinner and then make the next layer thicker so mm -hmm. that the thicker paint sort of overpowers the thin glaze? Oh, absolutely. 
it's, I guess, uh, to use a visual example of how it would work, say I was painting Little Red Riding Hood in a green forest. In the underpainting, I might make the forest that would be green with a red underpainting. Now, Red Riding Hood, I would still make with a red underpainting, because in the end, I would want that red to really pop. Does that make sense? I mean, another thing that I do with oil painting, I do this in general, not just if I'm doing an underpainting. I always wait for the layer to dry, and then I put some oil medium on my rag, and I just like buff it into the painting, and it brings colors back to life, and it really helps create almost like a film between the layers. And so depending on the paint, you can try different things. But yeah, there's ways around that. Alex, how about Leo Leone? I <laughs> love this illustrator. I grew up on Leo Leone's books and I just oh, love his work. They're so charming and it's so perfect to look at in here because they just come off as perfect images for teaching about color. Like even in this one, look at how the grass, the shading within the grass, I can't even call it shading, just that texturing you can tell it's red by the way it kind of tones down and mutes the green in some areas. And that also helps with cohesion because let's say in theory, you have the red part, you have the green part. Let's say you think, oh, I want to darken the grass. Let's add black. That's not going to pull the composition together in the same way because the black is like a whole other universe. And so if you stick to these two colors, it's a pretty big difference. And so this is a book it's called A Color of His Own. It's about this chameleon that goes around changing all their colors. And I love this one because mm -hmm. of the interaction, the layering of the red and the green in the middle. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> what is it about yeah. that layer, Alex? It's so, like, again, it's amazing how these come off as just beautiful examples in teaching color theory. Because look at how much space and depth is in that layer. And to me, it translates almost as the back part of the lizard is transparent. And the green is kind of overlaying it. You can, in just that one little space, it's making it a 3D figure. And it's so, so impressive. Michelle is asking, is it necessary to have all these colors you're mentioning? Can't everything be mixed from yellow, red, and blue theoretically? Actually, that's a great question because Tony Janello, who I've mentioned in the past, we have a video with him. When I got to his portrait painting class senior year, he walks in, he's like, okay guys, three colors. <laughs> he wouldn't let us <laughs> use anything. So we had to pick the blue, the yellow, and the red really carefully because he wouldn't let us use more than that. And I don't think that you have to do that, but it was such a good exercise. Why do you think he wanted us to only use three colors, Alex. What would that teach you as an artist? I think it teaches you how to survive. It <laughs> teaches you how to MacGyver it out of just the bare bones. And above all, I think it teaches you how to think ahead. And it's really funny because Elizabeth Byers said she does the exact same thing. I limit each painting to a specific red, blue, and yellow. I decide which red, et cetera, to use based on what colors I will need. And I think that says it perfectly, where when you had to choose just three, I if someone told me, hey, you have to make a painting, choose three colors, I think my first question would be, well, what do you want me to paint? And that would help me dictate what colors I wanted to do. I mean, when I had to do the paintings with just three colors, I panicked because I was painting with like six blues <laughs> at the time. <laughs> and yeah. I think what it did was I realized, oh my gosh, I need to get variation with so few sources and you got to mix. When I had six blues pre-mixed, I didn't have to work that hard with the mixing because half the work was already done for me. And I really got so much better about seeing mixtures. The other thing <laughs> that Tony said, he said, like, Alex, you ever mix the color and you just like can't make it again, like no matter what? Oh, it's so hard. Yeah, it's so frustrating because so, it was just this weird hodgepodge of grays and blues and like whatever was left on your brush. <laughs> and so Tony said, well, listen, if you only have three colors and you can't remix the color, you know it's got to be a combination of those three. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's just great. So I really like that a lot. So here we have Victor Nye, who's a contemporary illustrator. And how do you see red and green working in this work? Victor's work is so stellar. I just, I've yet to see a piece of theirs that I don't love. <laughs> and the way that the red and green is used here, to me, I view it as helping to divide the image. Do you see that in like separating the spaces and even separating the worlds? So it's a really funny way of almost not making a cohesive composition, although it does do that. It also separates concepts as well, which is really cool. I love that you brought that up because color is not just a visual. A lot of times there's symbols that we associate with color, moods and atmosphere. And so this goes well beyond just does it give you contrast? Mm -hmm. And I think that's important to consider. I guess that's why I don't like all that science because I feel like it gets in the way of really the heart of the piece, which is in this case, because it's illustrations, oftentimes there's a story or an article that they're trying to convey. And I feel like I have to stay in that territory because the science is gonna just kill me <laughs> later on. <laughs> Oh, Edward Hopper, thank you so much. He taught me yep. everything I do about complimentaries. <laughs> <laughs> so what is it about this painting, Alex, that is so useful for spotting complimentaries? What's funny is I love looking at this piece directly compared to Victor Nye's work. Like, with Victor providing a lot more, let's say, complex view of color harmony, Whereas Hopper, in not a disparaging way, is very straightforward. It is very just, I know how these colors work, I know how to present it, and I know how to invoke emotions with them. And he does so. And honestly, I have to say, I would not recommend Victor Nye's work if you are just getting started with color, because mm -hmm. Victor Nye's work, it's so complex. There's a million lines and patterns. I mean, it's beautiful, and I love it. But one thing I like about Hopper, he doesn't have a lot of details and his shapes are very simple. His compositions are beautiful. He really prioritizes light. And so I think that somebody like Victor Nye, while it's just beautiful work, it's harder mm -hmm. to really see the color relationships. And so I would say you guys, a lot of this process, understanding complementaries, it's not just you painting. I mean, sure, that's part of it but look at a lot of paintings. Look at all these Edward Hopper paintings and ask yourself, what is he doing with these colors? Like Alex, how would you explain this painting? This painting I love because it's kind of, <laughs> with colors I always think of that scene in The Sound of Music, which is like, when you know the notes to sing and then they can, you know, <laughs> sing. <laughs> like it's kind of like that where it's not just as simple as oh red and green complimentary kaboom it's done but this one look at how sickly it makes you feel with that putrid yellow and green and just how heavy you feel and then clara you love pointing out the little speck of red so if you guys can't see it it's tiny it's probably 0.01% of the painting, but it's on the figure that's on the far left. There's a little touch at the bottom of the neck and then a little bit near the bottom of the arm. And it's like, come on, Hopper, do you really need that red? Yes, you do. Mm -hmm. Like picture if that red wasn't there and the whole thing was green. It's a different painting because once that red enters the conversation, it's not the same situation anymore. And I'm seeing a lot of comments like Neil is saying, Hopper's works make me sad. And a lot of that is the color. I mean, th this is not a commute that I want to be on. Like it just looks so sterile and yeah. dead, doesn't it? Which it's funny because to me, like this is every commute I've ever been on. Every time I've ridden a bus, it feels like this. And then every time I see like, granted a well-painted, but just this saccharine image of like a charming person catching their sun hat as they catch onto the trolley. I'm like, okay, get out of here. That's not what it's like. This is what it's like riding the subway. Okay, we've got Annie Leibovitz. And 
I swear this photograph was like shot for this stream. It just couldn't get more perfect. Okay, not only is it the green background and the green stuff in the hair, but the green in the necklace. I'm like, thank you, Amy Leibovitz. You're helping mm -hmm. me so much right now. What's your take, Alex? Yeah, it's so beautiful to look at the colors within this image. Even if you, like let's use this underpainting technique to try to isolate everything. Like if you were to paint this image, looking at, squinting your eyes and looking at it, notice how much red is in the monkey on her shoulder. Like it's really fascinating to see how that plays with that subtle but still apparent green in the background. And it's just this wonderful harmony of just the simple rule of red and green. Well, I think by putting that monkey up against that muted green, it makes the monkey feel more red. So this is not mm. just, oh, the colors happen to be that way in the monkey. It's those colors against the muted yes. green make the monkey seem that way. So that's where color is all about context. It's not about color by color. You got to think about the whole thing. Now, this one, similar situation, but the colors are much more muted. I mean, certainly the red jumps out, but you can see the green is the landscape and it lets that red just pop like crazy. Mm -hmm. So you get incredible contrast. This is your guy, Alex. You got to talk about oh, yeah. Malay. <laughs> <laughs> Malay and just like, he's just like every painting is just, I feel like it could use a big punch of red. <laughs> and it's just, they're beautiful classical images of just really evoking a lot of a subdued passion through the color. And it's funny because we have this painting, which is like, ew, <laughs> like, what are you doing to me, Malay? My eyes are like burning right yeah. now. But <laughs> what a shift because the green in this one is, somebody might even look at that and not even say it's green. I think some people might look at that and say, no, it's brown. But yeah. it feels more green because of the red. And again, that's where the context really changes things a lot. Guys, we have an art prof share today, which is where one of you creates an artwork or two, in this case, from one of our videos. And so the art prof share today is from Noor. I'm sorry if I say your name wrong. I probably am. Noor Ulnihar Malik. And so this is a piece that Noor, Noor, sorry, did from our Elements of Art video, which was talking about shape. I'm just gonna read a little bit from what Noor said about the piece. So Noor says that she was very inspired by Malika Favre's work. She's an illustrator. And Noor learned the importance of shapes. We can create character designs and other complex shapes from basic shapes. The video is very informative, providing a huge array of artist works related to shapes. How do you think Noor did with this one? Noor knocked it out of the park. It's such a cool examination of using the shapes to form a composition and getting really creative of when to make them a literal shape, when to make them just a figurative shape, when to get wild and funky and to make a whole cohesive image. Nor I love the use of the negative space and the overlapping, mm -hmm. the way these colors go in front, well, not colors, black, <laughs> black and white, the way they go <laughs> over that oak leaf and the way things switch back and forth. I think that's absolutely brilliant. Now we also have another piece by Nora, and this is from our video, which is the same series, the elements of art talking about line. And so Nora says in her statement, she was influenced by Barry Mosier, who is an illustrator. And Nora says, I like drawing still lives, painting in acrylics, but this time I have applied lines on still life. It turned out to be a really different experience. What do you think? This one's so cool, especially in comparison to the other one, because it's like Nora, you're using line to create and define the shape, which is wonderful. And the, Clara, the second you said the Barry Mosier influence, I was like, oh my God, I see it. Because <laughs> it's so there, just understanding the thickness and thinness of the lines to create this space is super impressive. And I just want people to know that Noor is live with us in the chat. I'm so glad you can be here when we feature your work. And you know what I 
surprised by in this piece, Alex, is I think a lot of people think about line as being sparse or like cross hatching, like one or the other. And this yeah. one's be sort of in between, like it's not cross hatching, but it's also dense. Like it's got substance and weight to it. And I just think it's so <laughs> substantial. I mean, you did an amazing job with this, Nora. So keep going. You're gonna have to make a piece for every elements of art video now because you're on a roll. <laughs> Yeah, and you're getting some good feedback. You got AJ saying, la, 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 it's so <laughs> complex. How do you have the patience? Bleepkin is saying, awesome. I envy you. 10,000 crows, you are very good. Bleepkin again, that hand control. Yeah, knocked it so out. If of the you park. guys would like to submit for an ArtProf share, just go to ArtProf.org. You want to click on tutorials. And we do have a button here. It says, submit your ArtProf share. That will take you to a submission form. Or you guys can tag us on Instagram and just use hashtag ArtProfShare. We love sharing with the community what everybody is making. ArtProf has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And in a little bit, Alex will be hanging out with you guys in the ArtProf Discord in the post live streams channel. And we'd like to give a big shout out to our top Patreon supporters, who keep everything up and running. And we want to thank all of you guys for supporting us and for egging on Noor with the fantastic artwork and for all your questions and contributions to the dialogue. Thank you so much. We will see you next time. Bye.